How do you make insanity fun? Like... You crash it. Uh-oh! One part Bandicoot, two parts Looney Tunes. And four little switches that hurt your thumb. And you get Crash Bandicoot. In an era where mascots ruled the gaming consoles, Crash Bandicoot claimed the PlayStation 1. From the small beginnings of a game studio run by teenagers to Crash's jaw-dropping success that would take the fledgling studio Naughty Dog to the big time. And with that, let's rewind time and take a look back at the legacy and history of Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation 1. Crash outsold Mario. They didn't create Crash is what it comes down to. They tried to break us. They couldn't. I realized that we, that, that, that we were different, I guess, or something along those lines. If Universal had been more humane and reasonable, it is possible that Naughty Dog would still be making Crash products today. Before Naughty Dog took the world by storm with a Wily Bandicoot, Naughty Dog was, well, not even Naughty Dog. They were Jam. Not like the Jelly or the Space Jam, but Jam Software, or Jason and Andy's Magic Software. Named after the co-founders Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin. They were in high school at the time, so we can forgive them for the name. Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin met at Hebrew School in Virginia, near Washington, D.C., at the tender age of 12. Both had the old workhorse. <laughs> AKA the Apple II computer, which they could build games on. Jason, the louder, more misbehaved. Andy, the quieter, more well-behaved. At least not when he was getting into trouble with Jason. Compared to Andy though, Jason was the better artist. Andy though, a far superior programmer compared to Jason. Armed with their yin and yang computing symbiosis, they created their first game. No, not you, Crash. Math Jam. It was an educational game to help school kids learn math, so again, we can forgive them for the name. Math Jam may not have added up to much, but it was a start. Jason and Andy's next game, The Ski Craze, managed to sell. See, they were using a graphics tool set they licensed from a company called Bodville in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Bodville bought Ski Craze for a mere $250 and would publish it. Ski Craze wouldn't go on to sell a ton, but it still netted the two teens a few thousand dollars. Big money for two 15-year-olds in the mid-80s. Continuing their relationship with Bodville, Jason doing the art, Andy doing the programming, they would go on to make their next game. Dream Zone, a text-based adventure where you were trapped in your own dream and had to escape. It would sell a mild 10,000 copies, but with that, 16-year-old Andy and Jason decided they were ready for the big time. So they cold-called Electronic Arts' helpline. Electronic Arts being the biggest video game publisher at the time. Talking to Ye's front desk, the Jam Kids managed to get a producer on the line who asked them, you know, so what games have you done? The Jam Kids said, Dream Zone. The producer goes, I love Dream Zone. I'll totally work with you. Guess that producer was one of the 10,000 who bought the game. Also, both the Andy and Jason's dads were lawyers, which helped in negotiating their contracts with EA, becoming the youngest contractors to work for EA at the tender age of 17. But there was a hang-up with the signing of the contract. The name Jam Software. A company in Australia had the same name. With the EA contract pending, the two teens were given 24 hours to come up with a new name. Jason nor Andy remember how they came up with the name, but in 24 hours, they became Naughty Dog. The first game they made for EA was Keef the Thief, a point-and-click style RPG for the Apple II GS. Keef the Thief sold well enough compared to its budget, prompting EA to keep working with them. Enter Rings of Power. One ring to rule them all. No, not those rings of power. These Rings of Power for the Genesis, a complex isometric RPG where you play as a young sorcerer on a quest to collect the 11 rings. Then EA dropped the news, good and bad. The good news was Rings of Power was critically acclaimed and sold out of its first pressing of cartridges. The bad news, they weren't gonna print any more cartridges. Sega only allowed EA to produce so many cartridges a year. EA was ditching them for another game. 
They had this other game they thought was selling better, and we had a very large cartridge memory size, which cost more, and we had an EEPROM to store a saved game, a battery. So our cartridge cost more, and they thought they could sell out of the other one, so they printed the other game instead. That was Madden. Jason Rubin. With the cartridge debacle and EA cutting off their cash flow, the Naughty Dog boys were out, done with game making. Andy would go on to MIT to get a PhD in artificial intelligence. Jason would move to LA, learn to surf, and get a job in visual effects for the movie industry. About six months later, in the beginning of 1993, the former head of EA, Trip Hawkins, called the Naughty Dog Boys. He had a proposal for them. Mr. Hawkins was now in charge of a new upcoming game console known as the 3DO. And who better than the boys of Naughty Dog to come make games for it? Jason and Andy were skeptical. When the Dog Boys reminded Mr. Hawkins about the cartridge fiasco, Mr. Hawkins had an answer. CD-ROM. More powerful and cheaper to produce than the cartridges, the Dog Boys wouldn't get screwed on product shortages this time. Trip Hawkins gave them free 3DO development kits so they could begin work. Jason wanted Andy to move to LA with him and the beach, but Andy said he was going for his master's degree, so Jason had to move to Boston, closer to Andy. A master's degree trumped the beach. Andy and Jason take a gander at the game market. Keep in mind this for when we get to the Bandicoot. Fighting games were in. This is when Street Fighter II, Virtua Fighter, and had exploded onto the gaming market. Counting on the new 3DO console needing a fighting game, the Dog Boys went to work. They had no publisher. It was all up to them. Using all the money they made on Rings of Power, they bankrolled the entire production of their new fighting game. They were broke. The two friends worked tirelessly day and night, making the game that would become Way of the Warrior. As Way of the Warrior was nearing completion, the Naughty Dog Boys got themselves a space in the 3DO booth at the 1993 Consumer Electronics Show, CES. Their smart gamble on the market was correct. The publishers put their developers on titles they were grandly calling multimedia, Basically, multimedia titles consisted of lots of badly shot, interactive video, and weird semi-gaming crap. They all realized too late that this stuff wouldn't sell, and that they needed to be publishing real games. Unfortunately for them, there was only one real game that was nearing completion. Our game, Way of the Warrior, which was a half-decent knockoff of Mortal Kombat. Jason Rubin. The Dog Boys having nearly a full game ready to go caused publishers to jump on it, creating a bidding war. Companies such as Crystal Dynamics and 3DO itself showed interest. But then a friend of the Dog Boys introduced them to Skip Hall, who at the time was head of development at Universal. Yeah, that Universal. The movie company. Universal had decided they were now looking into making games, forming a division called Universal Interactive. The advent of new games like Myst and Seventh Guest, sporting real video spurred Universal into deciding to make games. These game makers would gain all the talents of Hollywood productions, from character artists to musicians. At least, that was the thought. Universal would win over the Dog Boys with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for what the Dog Boys' next game would be. And Universal would be allowing them to pick the platform, the type of game, the IP, and they'd float the entire bill. It was settled. Naughty Dog had agreed to a housekeeping deal with Universal, where they'd get an office on the Universal backlot to make their next game. Time to go to California to Hollywood. Despite his father telling him it was a bad idea, Andy's mind was made up. He would drop out of getting his PhD at MIT and go for a career in video games. So in the summer of 1994, he with Jason Rubin, along with Jason's dog Morgan, a gassy Labrador Ridgeback mix, packed up their things in Boston and headed for Tinseltown. The three-day drive would give them time to figure out what kind of game they were going to make. Like with Way of the Warrior, they decided to look at the current gaming landscape. It was the early days of 3D games like Virtua Fighter, Virtua Racing, Virtua Cop, and Ridge Racer. These were the rising stars of the arcade. So they deduced racing, shooting, and fighting were covered in 3D. What genres weren't covered in 3D? Hmm. 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 Oh, what about a character action platformer? Which was the dominating genre on the home console market. It was also one of the Dog Boys' favorite genres. Mario and Sonic. 
and the upcoming game they'd played at a few trade shows called Donkey Kong Country. But what would a game like Donkey Kong Country, Mario, or Sonic look like in 3D? As the two friends spoke about it more, Andy blurts out, Sonic's ass. It would be Sonic's ass game because you'd be looking at Sonic's ass the whole time. Yeah, I'm an ass man! Noting to themselves that they would need to get the character to have more face time and less ass time. More on this later. Arriving in Los Angeles, the boys of Naughty Dog, who never made an above average game nor a best selling game, were set up in the 447 building in the Universal Backlot. Right upstairs from the show, Sequest DSV. For beneath the surface lies the future. Remember that show? Me neither. They would even get to see Steven Spielberg at a distance, and his office was the size of their entire studio. Naughty Dog until this point had just been Andy and Jason, except for maybe a few work for hires or royalty programmers. Now with a new space came new employees. Their first hire was a superb programmer, Dave Baggett, a friend of Andy's at MIT, who they nabbed just before leaving Boston. They were also excited to work with their new Universal VP, Mark Cerny, who made a name in the industry working on such titles as Marvel Madness and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Originally, Jason and Andy were thinking of putting two games into production, Mark said no. thought they'd staff up to five people, but that they'd do two titles. So really the first conversation was, no, let's, let's spend the money, let's focus on one game, let's staff up to huge levels. This Sonic's ass game would cost about $2 million, which was a lot for games in those days, but not for a movie company like Universal. Next on the agenda, platforms. Which system would Sonic's ass play on? Well, let's see. There was the 3DO. It was dying an expensive, horrible death of not selling well. And with weak 3D power, it was an easy nope. How about the Sega Saturn? The benchmark of engineering excellence. With its unwieldingly Frankenstein dual CPUs? No. Well, maybe. They did end up paying for a dev kit. When Andy found out the dev kit was too clunky, maybe went to a nope. And then there was the Atari Jaguar. We don't talk about the Atari Jaguar. Jaguar! Jaguar! Nope! But there was another machine, a new player in the console war. Sony. And this machine of theirs called the PlayStation. It wasn't so much what the console had, it had pretty good specs, but it's what it didn't have that intrigued the dog boys more. Nintendo had its Mario. Sega had its Sonic. What did the PlayStation have? Sony would need a mascot. It was decided. The fledgling Naughty Dog with an unproven game console would take on the Titans, Sonic, and the infamous Mario, whose face at the time was more recognizable to children than Mickey Mouse. So let's say you need a creature. Something that will do what the Hedgehog did for Sonic and the Tasmanian Devil did for Looney Tunes. Where do you look? Why the Tasmanian Mammals, a field guide, obviously. At least that's where Naughty Dog looked. They found three creatures they liked. The Wombat, the Potaro, and the Bandicoot as potential would-be mascots. And guess what they picked? Nope, the Wombat. Willy the Wombat. According to Jason Rubin, Willy the Wombat was just a placeholder named to be changed later. Just as important as the hero is the villain. I remember it clearly. The four of us were eating at this mediocre Italian near Universal, and I had this idea of an evil genius villain with a big head. Obviously brainy cartoon villains have big heads. He was all about his attitude and his minions. Video games need lots of minions. Andy Gavin? The Animaniacs were popular in October of 1994, especially the characters Pinky and the Brain on the show. The Brain being a large inspiration for the villain that would become known as Dr. Neo Cortex, with his minions inspired by the weasels in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. For the design of Crash, I mean Sonic's ass, I mean Willy the Wombat. They wanted his look to be something like that out of Looney Tunes. So Mark Cerny suggested they go with Hollywood cartoonists rather than game artists. They hired independent artists Joe Pearson and Charles Zimbellis of Hanna-Barbera fame. 
They also brought in Dave Siller as a producer, who had worked on Arrow the Acrobat. Joe Pearson went to work building on the ideas presented by Naughty Dog. He created a backstory and a bible for Willie's world, basing a lot of it on the legend of the lost city of Lemuria. Lemuria is like Atlantis, and it fell into the ocean and was lost. Where it is, only conspiracy theorists know. Next, he did a lot of art for this tropical setting that Andy and Jason wanted, and some rough drawings for the main character's look. But it was Charles Rosimbilis' redesigns that would bring in the soon-to-be Crash, but currently Willie, to life. Several months in development, ND hired the last of his crew that would make Cry Willie the Wombat. So I was the first non-male that worked at Naughty Dog. <laughs> I found it actually to be a really welcoming place. It was it was a lot of fun. Everybody was young, you know? There was a lot of noise. I remember when I came for my interview, Jason met me. He was walking down the hallway and all I saw was Jason and a big black dog and I thought, wow, this place is great. <laughs> Charlotte Francis. As Joe Pearson's vast, lush jungle artwork came in and Charles Zemlis was able to hone and tone the game's hero, now it's up to the dog team in the office kennel to put it in the game. Speaking of which, how was it going on the technical side? In technical terms, it was going good, which in layman's terms means nothing was working. Andy Gavin, Dave Baggett, and sometimes Mark Cerny headed up this department with the PlayStation developer kit, testing it, calculating, crunching numbers and data in complex ways that would boggle our brains. I mean, they did, after all, have to do something that had never been done before, create a 3D character platformer. These didn't exist at the time. They knew they wanted their hero marsupial to move like a fully animated Looney Tunes character. So they would devote 512 polygons to the marsupial, a third of all the entire number of polygons that could fit on screen. These are the triangles that make up the entire game world and characters and such. Most characters at the time were a mere 80 polygons. These days, a character's face alone could be 50,000 polys. And he wanted to pull every inch of graphical power he could from this machine. He needed to see exactly how this thing worked. But as per their $70,000 rental contract with Sony for the kit, taking apart the console was forbidden. So Andy took apart the console anyway, and reverse engineered it anyway. Basically what he did, I'm gonna oversimplify it, but he changed the number of times the console would access the game disc. By accessing the game disc more, you could gain more memory. More memory equals better graphics. It would look better than any other game currently on the PlayStation. Now the question was how to put the art of Charles Zimbalist and Joe Pearson into the actual game. PCs of the time weren't gonna cut it. This wasn't Windows 10, this was Windows 3.1 era, where 3D didn't exist. Therefore, they went with the $75,000 to $100,000 Silicon Graphics Workstations, or SGI. Most notably, the Indigo 2. Extreme. These workstations made a name for themselves doing the visual effects in the movies Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. It's, it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. Jason Rubin built the first Willy the Wombat model in the SGI, which didn't look much different than the crash we know today. We had an art staff of three people. It was Jason, Bob, and I. That was the art team. We were all just doing the same stuff, but as we started to figure out what we were good at, Bob basically became the background department. Bob did almost every background in Crash Bandicoot. Jason became the animation department. He did all the animations. I became the game designer. We all pitched in for each other, but those were the different paths we handled. Taylor Kurosaki, and yet, even with Andy, Mark, and Dave's brilliant work to increase the graphical power of the PlayStation, its limitations were still rampant. Originally, there was supposed to be cutscenes to convey the game's story, but with the PlayStation limitations, almost no story was left by the end. They backed up almost entirely to just platforming. The bits of the story that were left about a genetically enhanced marsupial that was created by Dr. Neo Cortex to lead Cortex's army of animals and conquer the world. But happenstance happens, Willie escapes. Sadly, his girlfriend Tana is still there. Now Willie must rescue her and defeat Cortex. The confines of graphical limitation were so tight that Jason had Andy install a buzzer sound to go off every time the team went over the polygon count. In the design, the Willie slash soon to be crash design had to be built from limitation. What color will he be? He'll be orange because that color pops best on NTSC screens. Maybe for his hands, he could have, they had to give him brown gloves, otherwise his hands would blend too much into his body. Give him a tail, maybe? It would flicker as the PlayStation failed to render it. Give him a neck. Too many polys. How about a hat? Too many polys. Needless to say, the buzzer became the bane of the dog team's existence. By early summer of 1995, nearly a year after they had begun production, Naughty Dog had made two levels. 
and they were terrible. The first level, titled the Jungle Level, was a vast open terrain where you could run anywhere. But it took too much memory, too much open space. Obstacles and enemies were easily avoided, making it lack the F word. Fun. The other, slightly better, but still bad level was the Lava Level. Working at a barely acceptable frame rate, which was minor compared to the level's bigger problems of depth perception. From side to side angle, it's easy to see how far one must jump on any one gap. But from behind camera angle, aka the Sonic's ass angle, creating a good visual representation of how far you're to jump, proved beyond tough. All the people they found around Universal to test it couldn't make the jumps. Also, the hero marsupial's color was orange, which blended into the lava. Yet another problem to add to the list. So, no lava levels. And they could cross that off the list. The team was getting to the point where they wondered if this type of game was even possible. Could it even be fun? PlayStation was months away from launching in the US, and they weren't even close to finishing. 299. At this point, they weren't going to be a launch title for the PS1. Back to the drawing board. They wrote a plan for three new levels over the summer, taking in what they learned from the failed levels, focusing on the F word. Fun. And boom. These levels turned out well, well enough that they would end up in the final game. The first level was the tried and true 2D classic platformer, but rendered in 3D. The level would become known as Heavy Machinery, employing the technique of jumps, steam vents, hot pipes, bounce boards, the stuff used to great success in Donkey Kong Country. At the same time, they were developing the more elaborate Generator Room level, a level combining the 2D side to side with the behind Sonic's ass angle. And finally, the Sonic's ass type level, to the max, where you'd be facing the ass the whole time. Andy was especially happy with two of these levels, maybe not so much the maximum ass level, but it was playable. By September 9th, 1995, Sony's PlayStation reaches US store shelves. Naughty Dog had missed their intended release to be a PS1 launch title. The games are ready. Are you? Nope. The game was barely in what the gaming world called first playable, meaning the game was far from done. They did though have the concept and gameplay down. The question was whether they would have enough time and money to finish the game. As Andy says on his website blog, iteration is king, and they would iterate and iterate and iterate further and iterate better, expanding on gameplay and variety, bringing in writing levels, which all the kids love until they die too much, and channeling their inner Indiana Jones, the boulder levels, which would help solve the ass facing problem because instead of facing the ass, you were facing the face. They would tackle this further by you starting the game facing the camera and with death animations. Looney Tunes style. And yet, through all this work, Sony still had no idea the game even existed. So Andy took Taylor Kurosaki of the art team, who used to be an editor on DSV, both in the editing room over the course of two days, edited together a gameplay video of Sony's future potential mascot, set to Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. And with the tape hot off the VHS printing press, they handed it off to a friend who slipped it to the Sony execs. And Sony was impressed. At least the American side was. Unbeknownst to Naughty Dog was the power struggle going on between Sony of Japan and Sony's US branch, Sony Computer Entertainment America, or SCEA. Social and cultural differences collided against the two sides who argued over everything from the launch price to the length of the cords of the controller, let alone when a certain marsupial would show up. In the meantime, Naughty Dog had a game to make. Jumping and spinning and destroying enemies was fun. Still, the game was lacking something. It was a Saturday, I remember. We knew we needed something in the levels to busy them up. They were too sparse. They were boring. And we're like, we can't afford anything. But Jason really wanted something that was 3D. And I'm like, well, we need something that's 2D because we just can't afford enough polygons. We've used all the polygons already with all your, like, 300 polygon creatures that look so good, but they're using too many polygons. We don't have any extra polygons. And he's like, well, what's the simplest 3D thing we can do? And I'm like, 
Well, a box? <laughs> Andy Gavin. That was it. Boxes. Or more officially, crates. Jason and Andy quickly scrapped what they were going to do that weekend to box themselves in. Pun intended. Jason built the first box slash crate model and explosion animation while Andy did the coding. Iteration is king, right? So they had the normal box. Iterate to the question box. Iterate to the TNT box. To the metal box. Bouncy box. Metal bouncy box. Outline box. Aku Aku box. Exclamation box. Nitro box. Oh wait, that's for the sequel. Getting ahead of myself here. And like that, from Friday to Monday, the game became fun. Dave Baggett. Disclaimer. The game's producer Dave Silla throws some shade on this story, saying that he came up with the idea for the crates much earlier in the game's development. In drawings he posted online, he claims prove his point as well as other drawings of level design show he designed many of the levels and ideas in the game. Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin claim these drawings were made after a day of collaboration amongst the team. Yeah, more drama incoming. Prepare yourselves. According to Jason Rubin, Universal tried to keep Naughty Dog and Sony away from each other, possibly fear they would jump ship to Sony. But the first Sony exec would soon arrive, in person. Maybe verify the videotape that Andy Gavin and Taylor Kurosaki sent was in fact real. That exec was Kelly Flock, former general manager of LucasArts with good business sense and sharp expletives. He was amazed by what he saw. Gavin confessed to his taking apart the system and engineering it to his own specifications. Kelly had a notion of how all this worked, knowing that any forward or backward movement in a level accessed the game's console disc. This was known as hits. He asked Andy how many hits a gamer would possibly need to beat the game. Andy's math brain calculated. Roughly 120,000 or 140,000, depending on which source you read from. Either way, this wasn't good. Kelly told Andy the PS1 was only rated for 80,000 hits or 70,000 hits over its entire life expectancy. So Crash, could crash the PlayStation. Pun not intended. Kelly though didn't stop them, but told them to continue their work and that maybe they shouldn't talk about this with anyone else. For Kelly knew that Crash had huge potential. Now it was only a matter of convincing Japan. Ken Kudarai. Called the father of the PlayStation, through sheer willpower and tenacity pushed the PlayStation console into a reality. In a company that didn't take it seriously, Sony Music Division didn't want it, nor did Sony Electronics or any other division. At the time, gaming consoles were seen as toys, but Kudaragi didn't see the PlayStation as a toy. To him, PlayStation was more versatile than any other system. It didn't just play games, it played CDs too. And that's about it. So when brought up this mascot idea, Kudaragi didn't want a mascot for the PlayStation. To him, that would be like having Taylor Swift as the mascot of your iPhone. You may play Tay Tay on your iPhone, but she's not all you do on your iPhone. On the cold, hard <laughs> you don't associate one artist to everything you do on one platform. That's how Kudaragi saw the PlayStation. And Crash wasn't the only mascot to be presented to Kudaragi. There was the tragic, tragically short, Story of Polygon Man. Phil Harrison, former head of Sony European marketing business, always told it best. I remember walking onto the E3 booth in 1995 with Ken and seeing the Polygon Man design on the side of the booth. Ken just went absolutely insane. But the thing that really upset Ken was that the Polygon Man design wasn't gurod shaded, it was flat shaded. So the Polygon Man was taken out into the car park and quietly shot. Phil Harrison. Guru shading was the newer, smoother technology on the PlayStation. Flat shading was obsolete to Kudaragi. Other possible mascots had their short stints. Sophia from Battle Arena to Shinden. Anytime, anywhere. Parappa the Rapper. And Kelly Flock even went as far as to create another possible mascot game like Crash called Harry Jalapeno. Its graphics were so inferior to Crash it was never released. All possible mascots had been phased out or apparently shot. All that remained was Crash. Now it was his turn in front of the mighty Sony execs from Japan. Their response to him? Grim. We had been handed a document that compared Crash with Mario and Knights, or at least what was known of the games at the time. The Crash was rated favorably in graphics in some other categories. Two things stood out as weaknesses. The first was that Sony Japan didn't like the character much, and the second was a column titled Heritage, 
that listed Mario and Sonic as Japanese and Crash as other, the two negatives were related. Jason Rubin. The artwork of Crash, Nidoc had made for Sony of Japan, wasn't resonating with them. Something was off. So during a break, Jason Rubin went to their texture artist, Charlotte Francis, to alter Crash's design. Jason had been using all of his free time to study as much Japanese anime and manga as he could in preparation for this showing. He had never been to Japan. Jason had Charlotte close Crash's mouth and make him look less aggressive, shorten his hair spike, and change his eyes to look more like Pac-Man. She had to do it in 15 minutes. And she did. The new on-the-fly design Crash went in. Let us remember that in 1995, there was Japan, and then there was the rest of the world in video games. Japan dominated the development of the best games and all the hardware. It is fair to say that absent any other information, the Japanese game was probably the better one. Jason Rubin. The slightly altered Crash Bandicoot design sat with the Japanese execs. Hard to say if it was just the redesign that swayed them or maybe one of a million other possibilities, but it was this design variant that would eventually be the box art for the Japanese release of the game. Yeah, Japan was in. Crash Bandicoot would be published internationally on the PlayStation. Not without a few caveats, though. The Japanese version of Crash would require many changes in order to be suitable for the Japanese market. Gavin would later tell Ruben it was... Hideous amount of work at no small personal cost. Andy Gavin. Now that Japan was on board, bring on the analyzer probes. Oh, not that kind of probing. Oh, I'll just have programmer Dave Baggett explain. Once Sony decided that they were going to publish it, they started really studying it. And they had this analyzer tool, which is like a hardware-based analyzer, where they could sort of probe the PlayStation as it was running and see what the game was doing. The first thing that totally freaked them out was this idea that the game was constantly reading from the CD at 300 kilobytes a second, because their models of how long the CD drive would last were based on occasional access, not constant access. They were very worried that if they shipped this game, all the PlayStations in the world would break because their CD drives would melt. Dave Baggett. Luckily, the genius technicians at Sony figured out how to extend the lifespan of the CD reader on the PlayStation, so Crash would not crash the PlayStation. Crash was certified safe. As Willie the Wombat crashed his way through crates, crashed his way. Ah. Uh, that was the conclusion Dave Baggett and Taylor Kurosaki came to. Taylor himself is pretty sure it was him and Dave Baggett that came up with the name Crash. I wanted it to be Crash Wombat. To this day, I think Crash Wombat rolls off the tongue better than Crash Bandicoot. Taylor Kurosaki, does it? Please let me know in the comments. Oh yeah, so about that name Willy. Turns out there's a character named Willy Wombat on the show Tasmania. Universal wanted Wuzzle or Wezzy or Wez or some form of Wizza Wazza Wazza. Yeah. Ozzy and Otzel was also thrown around too. Naughty Dog fought back with the entire team of eight, marching into the Universal Bigwig's office, threatening to walk out if they didn't go with the name Crash, according to Ruben. But according to producer Dave Siller though, Naughty Dog was under contract and couldn't do such things saying Naughty Dog actually wanted Willy. Whatever the case, the result was still the same. Crash Bandicoot was his name, and that would be the name of the game. Now he just needed a voice. Uh oh. And that's it. That's all Crash ever said. It was done by the talented Brendan O'Brien, who in fact did all the voices for the first game. Why no actual voice for Crash? Jason Rubin believed, as well as many others in the industry, that giving a voice to the character you play can take away immersion. The idea is that you are Crash. If Crash said something you feel like you wouldn't say, you wouldn't feel like you were a bandicoot. This way of thinking has changed somewhat. Somewhat. As the race was on to finish Crash, Jason and Andy were working long hours, 10 a.m. to 4 a.m., seven days a week. Jason was even known to sleep at the office. Through the daily crunch on Crash, the Naughty Dog team became close. They ate meals together in the office, went to parties together, not in the office, and got into mischief on the Universal backlog. We chased the tourist tram with our golf cart. Andy Gavin. Once they got a golf cart stuck in Moses Parts the Red Sea, part of the tram ride, a tow truck had to come in and pull it out. We were problems. Jason Rubin. The team even went on a snowboarding trip together. This is when producer Dave Siller says he was left in the office to find a music composer for the game. He found Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo fame. 
I hired Mark Mothersbaugh and his Mutato Musica operation to do the music for Crash Bandicoot. The Naughty Dog guys went snowboarding and didn't want to get involved with this, except to try to bitch slap me. I got his contact from someone else at Universal Studios through Rob Bizna's contacts. Mark came to our offices and was wearing a frilly brown coat and green sunglasses, but he was cool. We hit it off, so I hired him. I then prepared and sent him an outline and description of the type of music we wanted. He and his group nailed it. I, I sent him a message telling him how much we loved the new culture pop music they were creating. The following days later, as I came to work, Ruben called me angrily into his private office and shut the door. He proceeded to yell at me using many curse words. Dave Siller. Mark Mosbaugh worked on some parts of the game's music and providing oversight, but almost all of the compositions would come from his in-house composer, Josh Mansell. For each theme, I had access to either an artist's rendering of a level or character, a verbal description, or a videotape of someone playing the level, or sometimes all three. This was very important in terms of creating each theme. After assessing the visual environment and gameplay intensity, I would build a percussion track that felt right tempo-wise. Then I would choose an instrument palette that I felt reflected the level. Josh Mansell. Then the trick was getting the music files on the game disc. With so much memory allocated towards graphics, Mansell wasn't allowed to have a lot of sustained notes, complex chords, or reverbs. Still, Mansell was able to piece together a tropical, bombastic, iconic sound. Ruben was reportedly furious over an email Siller sent to Mother's Ball. In the email, Siller says he was going to be the point man between Naughty Dog and Mutato Musica. Everything between the two would go through him as producer, which he says Cerny and Rob Binias told him to do so to avoid confusing the direction of their work. Back in Ruben's office, he was angry at me about this letter and then threatened my life. He said I was going to be sorry. I did not report this to management or anyone else at the time. I was a mature adult who could take this and wasn't afraid of Reuben, as I came from a tough neighborhood and had loads of associates myself. Reuben's father was a lawyer and I suppose told him to always act tough or people will shit on you. Those tactics do not work, but that was the final straw. Mark Cerny then used this severed relationship to get involved as Sony had just arrived. He said, quote, they don't like you. Dave Siller. Siller years later released an email he received from Ruben to add proof to this claim. Craig Anthony Perkins, Crash's Q&A manager, supports Siller on Ruben's behavior. All I know is Ruben bullied me as if we were still in high school, all for doing my job of finding bugs in their programming. He hated me for some reason, and Gavin was indifferent to me, but not very pleasant. Maybe it's because they were best buds with Mark Cerny and... I had unintentionally insulted Mark during my initial interview. <laughs> I've got to tell you that story someday. The rest of the crew were very friendly and supportive to me. Craig Anthony Perkins. In the months leading up to E3, Ruben claims Universal was trying to cut out the Naughty Dog name and take creator credit, namely at the upcoming E3 event that would unveil to the world for the first time the existence of the marsupial. We were told by Universal at the last minute, you can't go to E3, and we're not putting your name on the box, and we're not going to mention you at E3, which was contrary to our contract and made absolutely no sense. So I went out and printed 8,000 flyers that told the story of the creation of Crash Bandicoot and said, I don't work for Universal, I'm a contractor. It says in my contract, my name is on the box. We're going to put our name on the box, and we're going to be standing in front of the booth handing these out. And here are the eight people working at Naughty Dog, standing in your office, Mr. Vice President of Universal Interactive Studios. We'll go home today, and you won't have something to show at E3 if you don't accept that fact. And he bent, Jason Rubin. I read one report where Universal claimed that the reason Naughty Dog's name was not on the box art was an accidental oversight. Regardless, the dog team made it to E3. The world would finally get to see Crash Bandicoot. Nineteen ninety six, E three, where game makers, publishers, and fans get together in a melting pot for the latest and greatest upcoming video games and hardware. At the time, a bad showing at E three could be disastrous for an upcoming game. Crash was issued into a prime spot 
with an immaculate display and a statue at the Sony booth. Gaining the spot only days before the event, taking it from Sony's other game, Twisted Metal, crash faced right across from a certain rival plumber. Mario. Players came in droves trying out the action platformer. Even Super Mario Bros. creator Shingeru Miyamoto came to play the game. As for Miyamoto's reaction, well, it depends on who you ask. Some say he hated it, others say he was okay with it, and some say that it worried him, for new competition was in town. Still, a proud moment for Andy and Jason. But the ever-looming presence of Mario did merit cause for concern. In the lead-up to E3, screenshots and images were starting to surface of the new Mario game, called Mario 64. Now at E3, it was here to see, but the dog team saw of it was jaw-dropping. Still further to walk and jaw and sprint. This will also give you Miyamoto had created a fully 3D world for Mario to run around in. Luckily for the dog team, Sega for some reason wouldn't release a Sonic game for the new console on the Saturn anytime soon, instead having a new mascot named Knights for the system. The game looked 3D, but much of the game was played in 2D. As developers played Crash, they were dumbfounded by the graphics. How could they get graphics this good? Most developers believe you can only get 3 to 600 polys on screen. Crash was clearly pushing over 1800 polygons. Their conclusion? The crash demo was obviously a fake. Little did they know that sometimes you don't need to think outside the box. You only had to rebuild what was in the box. During the conference, the father of PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi, pulled Mark Cerny aside into one of the many rooms there. Kutaragi, still unconvinced of this marsupial's potential. Kutaragi wanted video games to look as great as his favorite movie, Blade Runner. Crash was no Blade Runner and for 45 minutes, he would yell and berate Cerny about the game. This crash is never going to sell. It has no heart at all. The only thing to make it passable is if every plant would dance to the beat of the hearts of the animals in the game. But it does not. So this game is crap. This game is crap. 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 Cerny may have been left shaken, but not stirred, as it wouldn't be long before the Sony of American marketing team, led by Andrew House, would pitch him an idea. They wanted Crash for their PlayStation marketing campaign in the United States. This zany idea, where a man would dress up in a Crash Bandicoot outfit, running off on a road trip, calling out Nintendo at their head office. Cerny and ND may have thought it was a little weird at first, but agreed it was the right move. Amy Blair, who would go on to do many of the marketing campaigns for some of Square Enix Final Fantasy games, took on manager of Crash's marketing. I swear when I was looking at the demo, I think my mouth was open saying, oh my god, I am so excited and so honored to be a part of this. I want this, this is my title. I think I would have killed the other product manager and fought her to the death if she like tried to take the title away from me. Amy Blair. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. We didn't want directly to insinuate that Crash Bandicoot was his character because he wasn't. He didn't have a voice in the game. He was a fun loving kind of accidental hero and we needed to be able to have a little fun with that. Amy Blair. I have to ask you to leave. You're hurting my elbow. Originally, they had plans to go to all of the game companies with the character, first Nintendo, then Sega, and the like, but the almighty dollar, or lack thereof it, squashed that strategy. Which begs the question, was that the real Nintendo building? It was the building next door. It was a Nintendo building, but it wasn't their main headquarters. But it also aligned with the fun of the campaign. This guy was so crazy, he would do pretty much anything, and he kind of was a very spur of the moment kind of guy. So it would totally make sense that this guy hadn't done his homework and had mistakenly gone to the wrong building. Amy Blair. Is that Italian? No, Bandicoot, it's an Australian name. Outrageous to think this now, but back then people were skeptical of Sony doing video games. This crash and the Suitman marketing campaign set out to show that Sony was the new rebel on the scene, ready to take on the corporate giants. After E3, ND was on the final gauntlet to finish the game. They had to get it out before the holiday season of 1996. These days, it's not as important, but back then, Christmas season could make or break your game. In the final stretch, Polish and Bugs were the name of the game. ND's sound engineer, Dan Cole Morgan, and Andy Gavin were on bug fixing duty. Sony had a team of 60 in a room testing Crash all day, every day. At 2 a.m., they'd fax over the list of bugs because in Japan it was like morning. Remember faxes? Yeah, me neither. We probably went through 500 pages of bugs a week. You know, some of them weren't really bugs. Some of them were due to a tester being confused or something. But it would be like, 
Okay, on level 17, Crash gets stuck in the weeds over on this part of the level. Okay, what's wrong with the collision detection? So, there's that sort of death march of bug fixing that really hit Andy and me hard, particularly on the first game. Dan Call Morgan, end. The crunch of 100 hour work weeks and harsh deadlines exhausted the team. It was hard, and it got really hard. It got very, very hard as we progressed along. Working six days a week, working seven days a week, eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner in at the office. I think at that time I was 25 years old and to not feel like you were part of society, a normal society on some level, you know, all my friends would go out and have fun or go to parties and that kind of stuff. And when we got really deep into production, all of those things went away for all of us. Taylor Kurosaki. Despite everything, the small team at Night Dog brought the game to completion and soon finding out that success would be a double-edged sword. On September 9th, 1996, Crash Bandicoot would hit store shelves and the reviews were... We were not well received by the press. Let's take a look, Jason. GameSpot Reviews says, graphics may be 3D, but gameplay is flat as roadkill on a four lane highway. IGN gave it a better review. The control is generally pretty good. Though it is a little sluggish in some of the levels. Generally though, Crash is a great game. The rest of the reviews seem pretty positive, with a big portion of the positivity going towards the graphics. The biggest thing though was that the game kept selling. It just kept on selling. And kept selling. And kept on selling. We thought Crash would do pretty well. We didn't anticipate it being the number one brand for PlayStation. Where some of the team was able to take a short break after Crash's release, Andy Gavin and Dave Baggett weren't allotted that luxury instead having to gear up Crash for the Japanese release. Changes were small to slightly big, such as the TNT letters on the boxes being changed to a bomb icon. The Aku Aku Mask would now speak up and give you gameplay tips. I remember some specific changes that were kind of amusing. You know, you're supposed to get all the boxes in a level, and if you missed boxes, then it counts them down by having them fall on Crash's head. And the word came back that the Japanese children who played it found this deeply disturbing. They were very upset by that. So we could just count them instead of having them land on his head and stuff like that. Dave Baggett. Hard work pays off. And it did, as the Japanese port of Crash would become a bestseller, eventually became the number one non-Japanese game to receive a gold prize in Japan for sales over 500,000 units. The era of Crash Mania had begun. Stop looking at me. But with success comes dissension especially in the credit where credit is due. As the world and news outlets started to ask where and how this highly rated game came into be, Ing, an article stated that Joe Pearson and Charles Endless were brought in only to tweak the character design rather than the actual designers that they were. They didn't create Crash is what it comes down to. They were the production company. We gave them the material and they put it in their pipeline. They didn't do it. The main creative force behind Crash Bandicoot was Joe Pearson, and the guy who worked out how the whole game would play out, all that kind of stuff, was David Siller. Not that the guys at Naughty Dog didn't have any input. That's not the case. Artist Joe Pearson was so upset over the misrepresentation that he terminated his relationship with Naughty Dog. To Jason's credit, he did call me at my animation studio and left a message saying he felt bad about what had happened and wanted to try to make things bright. I never called him back, and I should have. He did reach out to try to make amends. I should have taken him up on that. That's something I do regret. Joe Pearson. In more recent times, Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin have voiced how integral Joe Pearson and Charles Zembles were in the making of Crash. We outsourced design to like Joe Pearson and, and Charles Zembles, and we had Universal's music group do the sound effects, Mike Gollum, and you know, we, Josh Mansell from Music Mutata did the music, so there was a little more than the eight of us. Charles and Billis would continue to work with Naughty Dog. And then we get to producer Dave Siller. Yeah, that one, that's tough. Yeah. The game is but an internet search. Ow. Nearly 20 years after the release of the original Crash, Stiller angered by his friends telling him he was written out of the Crash Bandicoot Wikipedia site, as well as his wife dying five years prior, said he was tired of being dissed about Crash for years, and finally decided it was time. 
He came online stating that he was responsible for the gameplay design of Crash Bandicoot, and he would tell the true story of the making of Crash. I was the main designer of the original game, as well as the producer, but Jason, Andy, and Cerny do not want that revealed. They wanted all the credit, as they were all insecure and extremely greedy, especially when Sony entered the picture. They've threatened me, and I've kept quiet all the while, having them blackball me from getting work. I never produced an unsuccessful game, yet I still I can barely get work. Dave Siller. Siller started a Facebook group calling it Crash, The Untold Story, where he said he would reveal the true story behind the making of Crash. He would post drawings of levels in the game, insider tidbits about the creation of Crash. But one of the best things he revealed, that was never supposed to see the light of day. Crash, Crash Bandicoot should have been a genius, but he doesn't quite compute. Crash, Crash Bandicoot. Yes, an animated opening to the game, produced by Universal. Why was this not included in the original game? Maybe they believed that the 2D animation didn't gel well with the 3D nature of the game. Or maybe they just thought it sucked. Siller also tried to clear the controversy over Tana, Crash's girlfriend. Originally, she was supposed to be this sultry, voluptuous Jessica Rabbit type named Carmen. Her final design ended up being quite a bit different. The common story for the redesign was that Jason Rubin didn't get along with Kelly Flattery of marketing at Universal. Seems Flattery, having conservative values, objected to the sexy designs of Tana, and she was pushing for the Willie the Wombat name. Some of these rumors were exacerbated by Andy Gavin's blog, though it's very vague and he never mentions Flattery by name. Here's what Dave Siller had to say. Naughty Dog were under contract and had no power to threaten far superior minds to theirs. Universal Marketing had a concern that Tana was too sexy and voluptuous for the game rating they hoped to achieve. Dave Siller. What have I got? So, according to Dave Siller, he claims that Naughty Dog has erased him from their history. And for the most part, from my internet research and all the interviews I've looked at, he's right. With the exception of a few places. I show you. All right, so first we come to Andy Gavin's website, allthingsandygavin.com. And he mentions Siller briefly, and not by name. He does describe him, though, as a nominal producer and of dubious benefit to the project. Huh. Moving on. And that brings us to The Crash Files. Now, this is an art book where Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin wrote the foreword. Now, in this foreword, they do mention Dave by name, and they said, and I quote, our producer, Dave Siller, would then draw his cute level summaries to document the end result. Basically, this means that after a full day of collaboration with the team of coming up with the level design, Dave would go away at the end of the night and draw it up, meaning that it was a team collaboration that built these F levels, not just Dave. Now, this is what they say. Whether it's true or not, that's up to you. Now, there is one more definitive area, and this is, yeah, the, probably the most definitive one of rivalry between these guys and kind of an answer to it, or at least the best we're going to get. And that'd be from Polygon. <clears throat> Crash Bandicoot in Oral History. When it comes to Dave Siller, I do not feel comfortable saying he was a large producer of value for the game. I can probably go through a hundred names, some of which I've long forgotten before I get to Dave. I can make an argument in the other direction, that he not only didn't help, but that there were issues. Dave did not work on Crash 2. Universal terminated his relationship. He can say whatever he wants to say, and I certainly will not spend a lot of time going point by point. But suffice it to say that I remember vividly the day that Dave walked out of our office when we put in the rolling boulders with the square holes in the middle, again, low poly, and it went back to his office. We'd come up with it the night before, in the middle of the night, like everything else, because our hours were the middle of the night. He drew sketches of what we had done, and then walked into the VP of Universal Interactive Studios, who was Mark Cerny's boss, and proclaimed that he had created them. That is not true. He still shows these documents and says, look, I created all of these things. Jason Rubin. 
that's what he spent most of his time doing, is drawing these paper sketches. I have a whole bunch of them scanned, of level designs and these diagrams of how a creature is supposed to work. But in the case of Crash, 98% of those drawings were done after the fact, after someone else actually did the design and it was all programmed. Andy Gavin. He had a lot of suggestions for the game. I think most of his suggestions were not terribly actionable. They were divorced enough from the technological constraints or of the general constraints of realizing the concept that they were not very actionable. I could understand why he feels this way, but it's not really his version of things as far as I understand it. It doesn't strike me as a terribly accurate or fair to the folks who really did the 100 hours a week on realizing the game. So I don't think there's a real story here. I know people want there to be a story because it's exciting, but there was no sense of scandal in the making of the game. We basically just worked as a team and made this game. Dave Baggett. Polygon did try to reach Siller for the article, but he denied their multiple requests. He claimed to be writing a book. There would never be a book. Dave Siller would eventually close all his social media, taking many of the documents with him, stating he needs to focus on where his life is going and resolve his financial issues somehow. I'll leave us with one last quote from Dave Siller to close off this part. Being a producer in video games production at the time when Crash Bandicoot was developed was really a difficult job at best. You are to blame if it fails, and you're pushed aside and easily forgotten when it hits. The best way to manage talent is to influence them when they're unaware. Your idea this week is their idea next week. You plant ideas in their heads like creative little seeds. I coined a saying back in those days that is as true today as it was then. People love to learn, but hate to be taught. It is a thankless job being a producer as it combines great pressure and high stress, but if you are destined to follow this dream, then it is and must be worth the obstacles that stand in your way. If you have heart, then anything is possible. Many have thanked me for training them, mentoring them, or just supporting them and believing in them, but no one at Naughty Dog ever did. Dave Siller. After the completion of Crash Bandicoot, Dave Siller would leave Universal and Naughty Dog and take a job at Capcom. He would not be there for the sequel. And that's where we're going. Success can make things harder. I think that there was just too much pressure on us to deliver a sequel right away. Sony was counting on it because it was a big hit that they wanted another one right away. That was not something that I was ready to endure. Taylor Kurosaki? After the grueling long work hours and the harsh deadlines, artist Taylor Kurosaki would leave Naughty Dog and not return for seven years. Kurosaki originally believed that the dog team would have two years to complete a sequel, but with the success, that timeline got pushed to only a year, giving them only nine months to finish the next game. That would leave a lot of his grand plans for Crash 2 on the cutting room floor. Kurosaki's loss hurt, but the dog team had to press on and got bigger and added new employees. Where Crash 1 was made by a team of eight, Crash 2's team would expand to anywhere between 16 to 19 strong during production. Success had improved Naughty Dog's relationship with Sony. Their relationship with Universal, on the other hand... Universal had given us money to do the first game. By the time the second game came around, Sony was funding it. We were making it. Universal was just pushing through the money. They would get it from Sony, sit on it for 90 days, and then give it to us. We would spend it. Jason Rubin. As Naughty Dog began to question Universal's relevance, production of Crash 2 began in October of 1996. A new game engine was built known as Game Oriented Object Lisp 2, aka It gave them three times the speed, ten times the animation frames, and twice as many polygons on screen. If you're currently an artist in 1996, it brings tears to your eyes of gleeful joy. New engine means new character reworks, means new moves. Crash would go from only jump and spinning to... Crash Bandicoot. Character sketches from Joe Pearson not used in the original would now come to wumpa fruition in the sequel. Taz Tiger, now renamed Tiny Tiger, and the Komodo Brothers, becoming new bosses in the game. Josh Mansell was back again for the music in Crash 2, so they were set on that end. 
On the voice front, Clancy Brown was brought in to voice the evil villain Dr. Neo Cortex this time around, instead of Brendan O'Brien. Well, well, well. If it isn't Crash Bandicoot, welcome. Though Brendan would still voice Crash and Rio and others. Oh, and Tana, Crash's girlfriend, who he saved in the first game, was dumped. After the redesign fiasco from the first game, Naughty Dog had no desire to continue with her. What happened to her is never mentioned in the US version of the game, but in the Japanese instruction manual for the game, it says she ran off with Pinstripe Potteru, though there is no mention of this in the actual game, so basically it's not considered canon. With Tana out, in steps Coco Bandicoot, Crash's younger sister, designed by Charles and Billis, a heroic computer savvy Bandicoot that would pop in, dropping clues as to what Dr. Cortex was truly up to. I've been looking everywhere! I don't have much time to tell you this! giving me a nice segue into the storyline for Crash 2. The evil Dr. Cortex survived by his deadly fall from the first game because, well, Looney Tunes. So Dr. Cortex abducts Crash and tricks him into thinking he's saving the world by collecting, wait for it. <laughs> Crystals, of course. Now that the dog team was in sequel territory, that means bigger, better, and then some. So adding in reflective ice and sewers, cause the dog team wanted to get dirty with some levels. Next they added in more color palettes than the first game, your oranges, your purples. Originally they had designs for a level shrouded in fog, but games were getting harsh criticism at the time for fog because it could hide your polygon count. Therefore the decision was made, no fog for Crash 2. To add more freedom to the game, you could pick from a variety of levels to beat in any order. After finishing that, you get a boss fight. Rinse and repeat till the end. As Crash 2 was in production, Andy and Jason were sent to do various press tours for Crash 1 as it released in Japan and then Europe. When Jason and I went to Europe for ECTS in 96, we were giving interviews from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then we were drinking until 4 in the morning, then we get like an hour of sleep, then repeat like five nights running. Andy Gavin. Through all the conferences and interviews, the two could only grab a day or two to relax, but they chose to party. And party hard they did, all night, then hopping on a plane, landing around 7 a.m. and heading straight to the office. That's just the way we were. And it was like that in Japan two months later in November. The Japanese press were impressed that we're sitting there hungover, but still giving interviews. Andy Gavin. Crash 1 would get a greatest hits line by Sony, boosting the sales even further. Crash 1 was selling like hotcakes in Japan and Europe, reaching nearly 2 million sales worldwide by May 1995, less than a year after release. The dog team had little time to enjoy their international success as the long hours of crunch continued yet again for Crash 2. In some aspects, the sequel was easier. Certain game assets could be transferred over, and learning from the mistakes of the first game, they were able to tune and design their levels faster, which was the thing that took the longest in Crash 1. Though some things were easier, they also had to finish the game in half the time that they made the first game. By August 1997, Crash 2 goes alpha, with less than two months until release, so the crunch continues in a race to the finish. Ooh, wow, that was intense! Woo! I just flew in from the new ruins level and boy are my arms tired! <laughs> Maybe this is why they never had Crash talk. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, my bad. Thank you very much. That was funny stuff. This was at E3, 1997, in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, not LA. But still a big deal, and still a jam-packed house, even though no one seemed to like the venue or the location. But it is here that Crash 2 is revealed. Looking for me, Cortex? Um, With the Sega Saturn starting to flounder and the N64 starting to show its lack of games, Sony was in prime position to take the lead on the console wars. And Crash 2 was going to be a big part of that reason. The dog team worked their way polishing and fixing the game until it released on October 1997. Whew. Many of the dog team were able to take a month off. For some, this was their first break in two years. For Andy Gavin, though, there was still the alterations needed for the Japanese audience, once again. One of the strangest being the changes made to one of Crash's death animations. 
The one where Crash is smushed and is only left walking around with a head and feet? This was due to a serial killer at the time in Japan that was basically only leaving the heads and feet of his victims around. Oh no 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 way! And only in the Japanese version of Crash 2, if you put in a special controller code at the PlayStation screen, you get treated to this. The reviews for Crash 2, overall, were pretty good. GameSpot said, Crash is back in a sequel that is so far superior to the original that I'm willing to forget the mistakes of the past. IGN had this to say, Ultimately, Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back, is a splendid game. It's tremendous fun, but it also could have used a little more variety. On to Crash 3. You don't have to tell me twice. You know it's coming, so let's go. Crash 3. What have I got? Naughty Dog did not come out of Crash 2 unscathed, as Dave Baggett would be leaving the company. Yes, their first employee, Dave Baggett, gone. I knew these guys would change the world, and I wanted to be the George Harrison. One problem with this idea, however, was that they had been gigging together for so long with the idea of involving someone else in a really deep way, not just as an employee, but as a partner, was extremely challenging for them emotionally, and I think hard for them to conceptualize rationally from a business standpoint. This ultimately led to my leaving after Crash 2, Dave Baggett. Okay, irreconcilable differences. Got it. Dave would go on to start a software company, then sell it for millions or billions. I can't remember. But you need not worry about Dave. Dave's good. Naughty Dog and Universal, though, their differences were just starting. Mark Cerny, Naughty Dog's lifeline to Universal, and seemingly the only person they got along with at Universal, left his position as then president of Universal Interactive, but acting as a consultant between the two parties. Crash 3 was the last game ND had under their three-game contract deal with Universal. The question was whether to renew it. That is the question. That is the question. That is the question. That is the question. Andy and I decided that we were not willing to split the developer's share of revenue with an entity which was contributing nothing to the mix, which was extremely difficult to work with, and which was actively trying to take credit for Crash's success. So we announced that we were not renewing our contract, and we were leaving the lot after Crash 3. At that point, Universal Interactive's management lost their minds. Jason Rubin. And Universal's spite came in full force, according to Rubin. Iteration is king, and as the dog team set out to make Crash 3 their crowning achievement, again, they were on extreme deadlines to make the Christmas release. Their new Santa Monica offices weren't ready yet, so Universal Spite moved them into the hallways. To top it off, Universal refused to pay for air conditioning, where summer heat in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles can exceed temperatures over 100 degrees, which in turn was the temperatures of those halls. The problem with the heat bigger than the dog team's physical discomfort to it was the temperatures of the servers, which crashed as their temperatures rose past 130 degrees. They bought thermometers to keep an eye on the temperature before the heat destroyed their equipment. The building security prohibited them from bringing in a portable air conditioning unit, so they brought buckets of ice with fans blowing over them to cool their machines. Despite the heated working conditions, pun intended, Naughty Dog was still determined to make a great game. With Dave Bagot gone, they were down a programmer. Though the crew did add more later in development, spiking the Crash 2's 16 dogs to 19 dogs for Crash 3. With only nine months in which to finish by Christmas, we gave ourselves the challenge of making a third Crash game which would be even cooler and more fun than the previous one. We chose a new time travel theme and wanted to differentiate the graphic look and really increase the amount and variety of gameplay. This included power-ups, better bosses, lots of new control mechanics, an open look, and multiple playable characters. Andy Gavin. Thanks for the story segue, Andy. The falling remains of Dr. Cortex's space station. Free an ancient evil from its prison. Free at last. The Unka Unka, Aku Aku's brother, the mentor of Dr. Cortex and the true evil mastermind. Because this is the third game and because there's always a bigger fish. Baddies Cortex and Unka Unka enlist the Doctor Nefarious Tropy, or rather, Entropy, 
the inventor of a machine called the Time Twister Machine, to enable minions of the two big baddies to gather crystals from different times. And it's up to Crash and his sister Coco to stop them. As you can see by part 3, they're finally getting more story into the games, which is what they always wanted. Coco would be a playable character for the jet ski levels and the riding levels with her tiger Pura. Like Crash 2, you had your pick of levels in each section to complete in any order you desire, followed by a boss fight before you could advance further. The new boss, Dingo Dial, designed by Charles and Billis, which was a cross between a crocodile and a dingo in case you cared, and Entropy himself was a boss, along with returning favorites like Tiny Tiger and Injun. Crash gets new moves too, but now you can only acquire them after defeating one of the bosses. Under the tight production schedule meant they had to complete a level a week. That's twice as fast as typical Crash levels. The new type jet ski levels, motorcycle, and biplane levels had them designing new engines, new sub-engines, for a more free-roaming style. In order to facilitate this process, we wrote an interactive listener which allowed Google based game objects to be dynamically examined, debugged, and tuned. We were then able to set the parameters and features of objects in real time, greatly improving our ability to tune and debug levels. Andy Gavin. A big new feature of Crash 3 was the Relics, a time trial mode where you could compete and compare your time against other players. Seeing just how fast you were added wonderful replay value to the game. Oh, and if you've got a better time than me, I know, I know. You're faster than me. By March of 98, Crash 1, yes, it was still selling two years later, had become the number one best-selling PlayStation title in America, beating Final Fantasy and NFL Game Day, which they were number two and number three at the time. The dog team, sweating it out in their offices, eventually managed to sneak in an air conditioning unit to cool their servers. They disguised it as a mini-fridge. The dog team stuck it out, shirtless in the hallways, working 16 to 12 hours a day. And any attempts to move the team to their new office or anywhere else would result in them missing the deadline. And if they didn't release by Christmas 1998, they were dead in the water. For me, from August of 94 to December of 98 was one entire giant crunch. Andy Gavin. I could tell you endless tales of Universal Interactive's spite and contractual misbehavior that year, but that's all history. They tried to break us, they couldn't. Although we all worked shirtless at desks in the hallway that year, we got Crash 3 done. Jason Rubin. And yes, they did. And for Halloween, October 31st, 1998, Crash 3 released to the world. Like its two predecessors, it was a smash hit in the US, Japan, and Europe. You know the drill. Japan and Europe had their usual list of changes. Japan also had its full motion videos. Back in the US, Crash Bandicoot 3, dubbed Crash Bandicoot Warped, warped because, you know, the time travel and such. Anyway, it gets a heavy ad campaign for Sony. I'm not gonna tell you again, put the suit on. I'm not gonna listen again because I'm not gonna wear it. And this in conjunction with Pizza Hut. And in the Pizza Hut commercial, Crash had a very specific way you were supposed to eat the pizza. Not regular, but backwards. <laughs> Reviews this time around were again pretty good. IGN's take, Crash has come a long way from mascot hopeful to hardcore platformer fan's hero. His latest game may be largely more the same. That much is true, but in this case, it's more of a good thing. And that's definitely not bad in my book. GameSpot had this to say. In the end, Crash Bandicoot 3 is easily the best Crash yet. Minor gripes from the critics tended to include that there was not very much new in Warped, and that it was kind of short, which were many of the same criticisms from part two. I mean, they were only made a year apart after all. Crash's time travel adventures and Warped would go on again to sell millions. All three Crash games would be in the top selling PS1 games of all time. PlayStation had pulled ahead of Nintendo in the market, and a big portion of that was due to Crash Bandicoot. The two founders of Naughty Dog, Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin, were now millionaires. though they rarely had any time to enjoy it, as they were always stuck making games. Jason did, though, during Crash 3's production, get a Ferrari, and racing games became the talk around the office. 
Maybe that explains the many vehicle levels in Crash 3. And that maybe also explains their next game. The last Crash game they would ever make. If Universal had been more humane and reasonable, it is possible that Naughty Dog would still be making Crash products today. The day Crash 3 was finished, Naughty Dog moved off the Universal lot and started work on a cart game. Jason Rubin. Set up in their new Santa Monica offices free of Universal, Naughty Dog set out to work on a cart racing game. They originally wanted to make a racing game after Crash 2. At the time though, they were under contractual obligations in the mainline Crash series. Now free of obligatory shackles, a cart racing game they'd be making. This time though, the dynamic duo of Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin would be on different projects. CTR was the hardest project I've ever worked on. Andy, my tried and true partner who had been through everything with me, was working on Jack, Jason Rubin. I was 20 feet away, but mentally, I was on a totally different thing, Andy Gavin. Andy Gavin, Stephen White, and Mark Cerny set out to build a game engine that would eventually be for the next console generation of the PlayStation 2 for a project that would eventually become known as Jack and Daxter. Jason, on the other hand, and on the other side of the room, was left with a team of 16 to 18 dogs to make this kart racing game. Mario Kart was the infamous kart racing game since the Super Nintendo era, but the dog team took their design more from Diddy Kong Racing 64, the follow-up to the other N64 Mario Kart called Mario Kart 64. They built a replica of the Crescent Island track from Diddy Kong Racing, to see if this type of course and size and scope was even possible. It was, so the dog team was happy puppies. This course never made it into the final game because of that copyright thing. Which brings us to the next thing. Naughty Dog no longer had the rights to crash. So in the beginning stages of development, the characters on the carts were all blockhead stand-ins. They went to Sony with the idea saying, wouldn't this be a good crash game? Naughty Dog and Universal, like all the great divorced couples, were not on speaking terms, so Sony had to go and talk to Universal and get the rights to use Crash characters in the kart game. The dog team worked extensively to make this kart racing game not just another Mario Kart clone, but to improve upon what Mario Kart had done and go beyond. They focused heavily on how you would feel driving, to make it fun, not frustrating, and for that, they focused on speed. Perfectly time jumps, speed boost. Perfectly time drifts, speed boost. Collect 10 Wumpa Fruits, speed boost. Drive over green pads, speed, you get the idea. Skill rewards speed. ND wanted to give lots to do with numerous modes. Time trials to test your need for speed and then some. Four player split screen mode so you can destroy your friends or your young siblings who didn't play this game as much as you did. More battle mode where you could destroy your noob friends and siblings in a battle arena. One of the main attractions in the game was the adventure mode a story mode where you race in various events, eventually going up against a new baddie to crash, named Nitrous Oxide. As we were building the space round, it just clicked. Everything fell into place, why not an alien? Jason had the idea of four legs. Our Japanese producers had the idea of the very racer helmet-like design. Several American uh, producers had the feedback of the dreads coming out of the sides of the helmet. It was a very good mix. Did it click, or was this the reason? actually tried to kill Crash. Like in CTR, we said, what won't anybody believe? Because this is our last game. Let's put aliens in. We'll bring an alien. No one will like Crash after that because there's an alien. This will be the end. We've jumped the shark. The alien came into CTR. Everybody loved it. <laughs> Time and hardware limitation caused some things to be changed in the game. Characters Pola and Pearl were designed to be on one cart together, but graphical limitations prohibited this. So they were split into two different drivers. Same goes for the Komodo brothers which is why there's only Komodo Joe on the cart. There was supposed to be another snow level that formed a figure eight, but with no time to test it and debug it, the level was scrapped. Luckily, they had only spent a day on it. The whole day on it. One of their biggest mistakes came from a late addition secret character to the game known as Penta Penguin, who could only be unlocked with a code. Penta's first appearance in Crash was from the Crash manga in Japan. Yes, there was a Crash manga, loosely following the events of Crash 2. The mistake in the game came when they forgot to add in the voice lines for Penta Penguin and only left the temp voice lines from programmer Gavin James. Penguin Ye 1, Penguin Ye 2. Programmer Rod Titus figured this out as the first 500,000 discs were being burned, so it was too late for those. The voice lines were fixed when the game released in Japan and Europe, then it was later fixed in the US version of the game. 
The Japan version will get its own share of changes, and of course, bonus videos. Naughty Dog called the game Crash Racing, or Crash Kart while making it. Sony Marketing eventually coined the name Crash Team Racing. Naughty Dog further iterated on the title, so by the time E3 1999 rolled around, it was called CTR, Crash Team Racing. Crash was back again with Pizza Hut for more backwards eating pizza. I'm not in the wrong here, am I? You're getting the warning. What? La, la, hey, la, 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 la. CTR also received a promotional NASCAR driven by Rick Mast. Here's the car now being pushed off the raceway for a front wheel bearing problem. Yay! Go Team Crash! After eight months and six days in the making, CTR Crash Team Racing came out on September 30th, 1999, right before Y2K. Reviews for CTR Crash Team Racing were pretty dang good. Sitting at a lovely 88 here on Metacritic. CTR are going to sell 1.9 million units in the US and over 300,000 in Japan. Sales were especially good for CTR in the state of Utah, where all the Mormons are. Seems the Mormon population really loves CTR, as its initials are the same as certain Mormon phrases like choose the right or Christ the Redeemer. Mormon parents bought the game for their kids believing that the game had some religious meaning. And who's to say that they were wrong? There were these mystery screenshots, these shots that made everyone wonder if Nitrous Oxide was a playable character. Naughty Dog's artist Evan Wells cleared this up by saying that, yeah, the team thought about it, but technical limitations stopped them from ever making him a playable character. He is playable, though, if you cheat. Game Genie, Game Shark. He's buggy as shit, though. Simply put, CTR is Naughty Dog's last dance with our bandicoot. It is quite possible that Crash will appear again in the future, but it will not be in a game developed by us. Jason Rubin. CTR would be the swan song for Naughty Dog. Leaving Universal meant leaving Crash, but to maintain their freedom, they had to strike it out on their own and start fresh, creating something new. As 1999 came to a close, the dawn of a new millennium and a new console generation was on the horizon. With Naughty Dog out of the picture, Universal had to figure out what to do with this marsupial that made them so much money. PlayStation 2 and the newcomer to the console war, Microsoft, with their Xbox, were about to hit the market, offering a new level of graphical fidelity. Oh yeah, Nintendo had a console too. What was it called? GameCube and it's small. <laughs> and with the PlayStation 1's lifespan coming to a close, Universal was able to eke out one last Crash game, and it's a party. It's a bash. It's a Crash Bash. See, Mario was a platformer game, Crash was a platformer game. Mario had a racing game, so Crash had a racing game. Mario had a party game, so you all see where I'm going here. Crash Bash, a party game, made up of mini games within a game that you could play with your friends. Developed by the now defunct Eurocom Entertainment Software, known mostly at the time for porting a slew of games to other systems like Mortal Kombat 4 and Duke Nukem 64, as well as the makers of the James Bond games. Except for Goldeneye. They didn't make that game, no. Back to the party. Story-wise, Crash Bash has Aku Aku and Unka Unka at odds with each other, as Tiki Masks tend to be. So to settle their gripe of which is stronger, good or evil, they agree to a contest where their friends will compete against one another. Aku Aku doesn't have as many friends, only Crash and Coco, apparently, so Tiny Tiger and Dingo Dial are put on Aku Aku's team. Why? Because fairness. Let the games begin. You'll pick your character, many of the Crash favorites are here again, and newcomer named Rilla Roo. He's a cross between a gorilla and a kangaroo. On the small chance you were wondering. Once you decide on who to pick, you'll get to play through a series of mini games. Ballistics, Polar Rush, Crate Rush, blah 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 blah. There's lots to do. You can hop between all these games until you win enough and then you get to fight a boss and then you get to the next area, rinse and repeat. You gain rewards and prizes and winning for each of these games. Kinda like in a carnival, which is also the name of the Japanese version of Crash Bash. Crash Bandicoot Carnival. Crash Bash released to some really good reviews and some very, very, very mediocre reviews. Critics cited that the best part of Crash Bash was playing it with friends. After all, partying alone is kinda rough.
But the ambitions of King Kudaragi were already coming to pass. The idea of console mascots were to becoming a thing of the past. As the Xbox, like the PS2, were about advertising more than just games. So many people bought a PlayStation 2 just because it could also play DVDs. And Nintendo's GameCube didn't even launch with a Mario title. Sega itself had abandoned the console war after the failures that were the Sega Saturn and Dreamcast. Sonic was then free to reign elsewhere. And so was Crash. In September of 2000, IGN released an article saying Universal and Konami had signed a five-year deal. This meant Konami would be the publisher for Universal's upcoming slate of games. Game development, though, was still left up to Universal and whomever they picked. But Crash would no longer be exclusive to the PlayStation. It was no longer the PlayStation's mascot, but Universal's. There would be many Crash games over the years from many developers, as Universal Interactive was bought by Vivendi Media Empire, eventually merging with Activision to become the infamous Activision Blizzard. These games would never capture the magic of the original games from Naughty Dog, in fan numbers nor in sales. Don't get me wrong, Crash games like Twin Sanity and Crash of the Titans have gained a cult following. But he was a different Crash in those games. And it would be nearly 20 years before Crash would reclaim his roots. With the release of the Insane Trilogy. All three original Crash games in one package, completely remade from the ground up with updated graphics for today. The Crash of Old was back. It was going to sell 10 million copies, a roaring success beyond expectation. Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin left Naughty Dog after the completion of the Jack and Daxter series. But that doesn't mean that the current devs forgot where the company came from. In the release of their game Uncharted 4, A Thief's End, the main character Nathan Drake played Crash Bandicoot. Push the start button. I knew that. All right. I got it. Naughty Dog rebuilt the entire level specifically for Uncharted. And then with Crash 4, it seems to be a culmination of years and years of iteration. It could be even considered a true sequel after all these years to Crash 3. Many games have evolved over the years, changing from what they once were. And many have come full circle, finding themselves right back where they started from. Crash has done just that. Sometimes going on different paths is the only way to find out who you truly are. Though the game consoles no longer need mascots, Mario and Sonic are still around. And it's good to see Crashes too. Because for those who played Crash on the PlayStation 1, they remember him fondly. Thanks for watching. This is Kev, signing off.